they say in esoteric circles, if you don't have the organ of perception, if you don't actually work on yourself to perceive in the proper way, you just see the world as it is, not as it could be. Rudolf Steiner could see the world as it could be, not as it was or as it is even now. He saw the world as it could be, and that's a lonely path. It's a very lonely path. For me, what, what is unique about the work of Rudolf Steiner, what's inspired my life about it, is that it's not just a tradition. He threw down the glove and said, you have to do something with this. I think one of the greatest challenges that Rudolf Steiner poses to us today is a challenge that he lived with in his own life, namely the challenge to battle against sectarianism. Yes, he felt sorry because he wanted to help people, but he wanted more than this, he wanted to let them free. So that's, that's the essential point, it's the freedom. And you can help people and give them your own treasure but finally, they live out from your treasure and they are dependent. And that's the last thing Steiner wanted to have, dependent people. I think Rudolf Steiner was a realist and a very practical person. I think he, he saw that he was planting seeds for the future. Class one at the South Devon Rudolf Steiner School. Only now, age six to seven, are the children starting formally to learn to read and write. And like much of the teaching in Steiner schools, music and art are incorporated into the lessons throughout childhood. The South Devon School is one of 35 Steiner Waldorf schools in Britain. The first Waldorf School was founded by Steiner in 1919 at the request of Emil Molt, owner of the Waldorf Cigarette Factory in Stuttgart, who wanted an education for the children of his employees that prepared them for life in its fullest sense. And life in its fullest sense means educating hands and heart as well as head. Until the children go into class one around the age of seven, the emphasis is on play, imitation and on rhythm. Baking on Monday, painting on Wednesday, an expedition on Thursday and so on. And on stories which are told rather than read by the teacher. And Steiner's picture of child development is not only of children growing up and thereby learning the ways of the world, but also of children growing down bringing into life their own unique biographies, as he saw it from many lifetimes. And this needs time, time to build a strong and firm foundation so that each child can not only then face the world as it is, but also develop the strength of character to maybe change it. These nine-year-olds are not just studying farming, but actually doing it as part of what is called main lesson. One particular subject taught for the first two hours every morning over a period of three or four weeks. Around this age, most children start to take a new interest in the world around them, whilst also experiencing a certain separation from that world. Now they begin to study science, and in mathematics the concept of fractions. Still waiting for science. Now, who remembers which are those potatoes from the ones we planted? Are they early? early? 
Only early? <laughs> Lily? First early. First early, thank you. Who can show me blight in this potato? Lily, show something to me. Can you see? I can see from where I am. Quite right. Yeah? Every digger should have two other ones working together. So it should be groups of three. A digger and two collecting the potatoes. The plants should all be brought, brought back here, please. Yeah, girls? That's perfect. No, that's fine. So one on this side. Um, you are too many here. Well, they really seem to be enjoying themselves. I thought children weren't meant to like gardening. <laughs> they, 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 they like gardening very much because they can see the end result. So they've been involved in the ploughing of this field, well, spreading the muck, uh, the ploughing of the field, which was done by horses. So they actually pulled the plough. So they had, what is that? Can we see the lamb? Soon. Yeah? That's a big one. How many? Seven. Very gentle. Nine. Whoa, wow, look at that. They respond very well to the activities we propose, uh, it's the practical ones there. Yeah. Yes, let's do it. And there's a real enthusiasm that comes from them. Where are you from? I'm from Brazil. Brazil. I'm yeah. from Brazil, yeah. So there are Waldorf schools in Brazil too. There are Waldorf schools in Brazil. Yeah. But I wasn't connected uh, to schools there. I was connected to the biodynamic impulse, yeah. but not to schools. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're doing both. Right. That's right, yeah, yeah, sort of bringing them together, really. Yeah. Andre is also helping this class to build a stall from which they can sell the vegetables. Building is another subject taught at this age. Planning, measuring and execution. The curriculum in Steiner schools is designed to introduce subjects when they resonate and correspond to where the child is at in his or her development. Insight into what you teach when and a recognition of distinct seven-year phases in child development were two of Steiner's special contributions to education. What is the introduction? Um, that's to support, that's to attach the two poles together to make them both steady. Where we walk to school each day, Indian children used to play all about our native land where the shops and houses stand and the trees were very tall and there were no streets at all not a church not a steeple only woods and indian people only wigwams on the ground and at night they're prowling round what a different place today where we live and work and play. Please have a seat. Jack Petrush has been a Waldorf teacher for 30 years, and this is the fourth time he's taken a class through the eight years until the children reach the age of 15. Silent arithmetic. Here we go. Reverse the digits. Neil. Excellent. Good. Nearly, why did you help us? Nearly two hours later, and the morning main lesson is over. 
One of Jack's concerns is that in the Waldorf school movement, there isn't always sufficient interest and appreciation for some of the positive things being pioneered in mainstream education. On the other hand, mainstream appreciation of Waldorf methods is also not much in evidence. I asked him if any sort of dialogue is taking place. I wish I could say that it was happening in um, a marked way, but it happens more in small ways. There are educators who are coming out of mainstream who can appreciate what Waldorf has to offer. Good, listen carefully. But unfortunately, they're few and far between. And in our climate in America, with no child left behind, and the tremendous pressure on testing that came out of the Bush era, and has continued, unfortunately, with President Obama, it's very hard for the ideas of, that are essential to Waldorf to resonate within the educational community. There's just too much pressure. <laughs> the man who trained me to be a teacher, John Gardner, he taught us that discipline begins with self-discipline and that it's our ability to take ourselves in hand that really will help us to guide children in the right way, to be worthy of all they give you, because children look up to you in the most remarkable way. They see us as better than we are. You know, they, they when they're young, um, they, they see us um, as individuals who hold knowledge. I want you to just uh, trim it off a little bit. Right. And wisdom and like the ability to solve their problems. And it's not that we ever can live up to that completely, but if, we, if I work on myself, then I feel at least I'm more worthy of the love and affection they give you. I think about the world that the children that we teach and raise will inherit and how many problems will be in that world. And I think about the kind of thinking that's going to be needed to solve the complex, seemingly insolvable problems that we have in the world with the environment, with our cities, with our prisons, and even in America with our democracy. And I know that the problems aren't going to be solved easily. They're going to require a type of thinking that is new and innovative. And I believe Waldorf kids, and I'm not just saying this to, to sell Waldorf, but I believe the kind of thinking that's fostered in a Waldorf school allows children to think out of the box. I feel children are going to need to ask the questions that nobody's asking yet to help solve the world's problems. Later, I talked to a group of 18-year-olds at Michael Hall in Sussex, the first Waldorf school to be founded in Britain back in 1925. I asked them what they'd most appreciated about their education. I think what I like most about science education is that it prepares you for life, not yeah. for just exams. Yeah. And I think when you leave school, you're prepared for all aspects of life. Yeah. Not yeah. just prepared yeah, for an exam. Yeah. yeah. It's not just crafts and arts, um, and it's not just academic, it's finding a balance about everything. And that's where, that's how we go out into the world, is potentially we, have, we go out as balanced human beings to grow and to mature and so on in later life, but it, that's, that's what makes it so rich. These books, they're called what, your main lesson books, aren't they? I know they're not necessarily your own, but did you, did you find that helpful to do things that way? I mean, you didn't have textbooks, you created your own textbooks, is that the idea? Yeah. Yes. It really is a very interesting way of looking at things because you're learning on a group basis, but very individually. I think that's a really good mix. Yeah. The main lessons are, are really one of the, like, the most inspired parts of standard education. Yeah. One of the biggest problems we have at the moment is that uh, at least the West seems to be descending into this state where everyone needs constant gratification of little bits all the time, so constantly consuming, you know, a bit of fast food or, you know, something like the, the website Twitter. You know, we can no longer be bothered to read anything longer than 100 characters. Um, the thing about main lessons is because it's a long block of doing one thing, it, um, 
it really uh, develops your, your ability to, to kind of absorb and actually immerse yourself in something rather than just needing it instantly in a bite-sized piece. You, you have time to, uh, time to uh, digest it, I suppose. Michael Hall, like nearly all Waldorf schools in Britain and America, is a private fee-paying school, thereby putting it out of the reach of most children, not at all what Steiner would have wished. In most of continental Europe, Waldorf schools receive government support. Now, in the UK, there are moves to change the situation. Government funding, so far without unacceptable strings attached, is coming the way of what used to be the Hereford Waldorf School, founded in 1983, and now, since 2008, the Steiner Academy Hereford. One government stipulation was that the school had a principal. Traditionally, Waldorf schools are run collectively by a college of teachers. Here, the principal, Trevor Mepham, who's been connected to Waldorf education for 25 years, is supported by his deputy, Clarence Harvey, who came from mainstream secondary education in Liverpool. I asked Clarence what drew him to a Waldorf school. Oh, that's a long story. <laughs> um, I suppose, essentially, uh, I believe in what it's trying to do. Um, that there is something missing, that's my experience, there's something missing in mainstream education. And I have been aware of Steiner education for many, many years through my professional training and experience and so on. And um, I suppose I recognize in it uh, the possibility of something different emerging. So I was very drawn to helping that to happen. What, what, what would be different then? In a word? Yes, you, you know. In, I mean, in a what, word, yeah. In a word, what's different is yeah. that um, I think this education makes it central that we're dealing with the children and who they are and who they can be rather than with external demands of society. External demands of society are important, but it has to start with who the children in their deep selves, who they are. So for me, that's, that was an exciting... Um, an important thing to, to help support happen. Is it possible in, in schools, in publicly funding, funded schools with all the accountability, to not lose sight of the children? the Washington Carver School near Sacramento in California, one of nearly 5,000 charter schools throughout the USA, and, like the Steiner Academy Hereford, publicly funded and free to students, but independently operated. The head, Allegra Alessandri, is gradually introducing Waldorf methods into what was one of California's most persistently failing schools. A further 20 charter schools in California alone are likewise bringing some of Steiner's educational ideas to youngsters for whom fee-paying schools are out of the question. I asked Allegra how the pupils and their families have reacted to her initiatives. Is there resistance or do they respond? Well, because we are a school of choice, students opt out of their large comprehensive high school to come here. So they're making a choice to be here. And mostly what we hear the majority of the time is, why didn't I find this sooner? We have students who are very creative and artistic, who have been um, really languishing in the system, who have been failing in the system, and yet are very bright students with enormous talents and um, they come here and find a place to flourish because we do, because they are developing and growing, and that's recognized. 
The compromises that inevitably arise when Waldorf methods are introduced into mainstream education are a problem for some Steiner purists. But it seems to me, on a visit to a school like this one, that Steiner would be delighted that people are experimenting and moving beyond the borders of a movement that can all too easily become inward-looking and even elitist. And perhaps most important of all, Allegra and her team are making an important contribution towards helping and encouraging less fortunate young people. I asked her what it was like when she first took over. Uh, there was gang activity. We called the police two, three times a day. We had regular drug busts. We confiscated um, many, many ounces of marijuana over the school year. Uh, we had many fights that we were breaking up in classrooms, outside of classrooms. There were maybe two or three thefts a day. Yeah. Allegra used the word process to describe what is happening at her school. Not yet a full Waldorf curriculum in place, but they now have a choir, a garden, fruit trees have been planted, Waldorf trained teachers are gradually joining her, and fighting is a much more skilled and disciplined affair. Many such initiatives, not just in schools, inspired by Steiner's insights into the nature of the human being, what he called anthroposophy, are springing up all over America and elsewhere in the world. Coordinating a whole series of activities, agricultural, educational and cultural, in upstate New York, in Hawthorne Valley, is Martin Ping. There's a lot that doesn't seem to make too much sense anymore, and, and, uh, and yet we've grown up with it. This is, we've created it. Human beings have created the system we're in now, so, so there's something in that that we are challenged by, because it's not like it was necessarily just imposed from outer space or something. We did this. So how do we find our way out of it if, it's, if, we're, if we're beginning to see the cracks and we're beginning to feel like it's not meeting us at a very, very deep human level, then how do we... How do we find our way back out? I think Steiner really had a lot of very fine indications that provide a bit of a roadmap for that. And, and it's not just Steiner. I mean, there's obviously many, many uh, ways in which people are approaching our modern predicament. Agriculture is certainly one of our modern predicaments. And already back in 1924, when Steiner gave a course of lectures to farmers in Central Europe, there was concern about the effect that chemical fertilizers were having on the soil and on the quality of the food we eat. The importance of organic farming is increasingly recognized. Steiner's biodynamic method goes further in that the preparations used on the land are designed not only to enhance the quality of the produce, but also to heal the earth in the process and a recognition of the role that not only the sun and moon, but also the planets play in plant growth and health determines when you sow what. I asked the farmer at Hawthorne Valley how he would describe the challenge posed by Rudolf Steiner's insights. I think his basic challenge, I would think he was so far, I mean, I think the picture of agriculture that he gives is gonna be valid for hundreds and hundreds of years still for us to really grasp it. And, and then certainly the, the real challenge for all of us is um, <laughs> develop the insight and develop the, the, the capacities to really see what he described. You know, it's not good enough to just be able to recount it. We'll have to be able to see it. To develop insights and capacities of their own, is what these two modern-day alchemists are trying to do in this Californian garage. Their task, to make biodynamic preparations based on indications by Steiner that are not only an effective alternative to chemical and potentially harmful substances that are marketed worldwide, but are also more appropriate to the soil and climate of California and the tropics than those used in Western Europe. I asked Dennis Klocek to what extent Steiner was tapping into something that we knew in the past and have forgotten. Rudolf Steiner didn't appear just out of the blue. Uh, there's, there's an old saying, genius never escapes its age. So he was a genius. And 
he brought f the best elements from the ancient traditions together and synthesized them in, in a scientific context. That's why his work is called Spiritual Science. He felt it was really important that the scientific context be recognized by spiritually minded people. Because he grew up at a time <clears throat> in his development when spiritism and Ouija boards and table tapping and seances, that was the way people got access to spirit. And he inherited the mantle of theosophy, and that was part of their lore. And what he said was, no, it has to be made in the same way that we make science. However, on the other side of science is this death rationale force that can't imagine life forces and beings as spiritual beings. That's a whole other dimension, and they're separated now. And so it's necessary to bring those two together. For, in order for science to be redeemed, and in, in order for spiritual wor work to, be, to move into the future rather than just be stuck on what we inherited from the past. It has to move into the future, but the scientific revolution is not uh, random. It's not an anomaly. It's a reality. So it's not going to go away. So the scientific worldview is not going to go away. So we can't just go out and hug trees and talk about fairies and hope that that's going to go somewhere. Even if that's the perception that we have, uh, that has to be grounded in, um, in reason. So it's both. It's an inheritance from the past. And if you read Paracelsus and Basil Valentine and the alchemists, you'll see everywhere in their work is this threads that Rudolf Steiner was picking on and pulling forward. And yet, with his cosmology and his rational training in science, he could move it further. Dennis Klocek teaches consciousness studies at this college near Sacramento. His colleague, Matthias Baker, a fellow researcher, is consultant to a number of biodynamic vineyards in California. When Dennis referred earlier to his preparations as medicine for the earth, I asked him why the earth needed medicine. If we left it alone and stopped spraying it with chemicals, wouldn't it be perfectly happy? No. If we left it alone, it would be very lonely because it's our mother and she says to us all the time, you haven't called home in a while. You're only using my bank account to live. So you need to love me and nurture me and uh, feed me with medicines because I'm sick from your neglect. The Benziger family have, in Dennis Klocek's words, been nurturing this plot of land for over 30 years. Biodynamic wine is becoming highly prized, not just here in California, but across the world. And like all biodynamic farms, this enterprise avoids the modern trend for monocrops. Alongside the vines, there are animals and a great variety of plants and herbs that help regulate the insect population and balance the farm as a totality, avoiding the need for chemicals and artificial fertilizers. They call it the insectary. Basically, it, it propagates with bugs, then they sort it out. We, we, we have some good bugs and some bad bugs, then they slug it out here. Um, and hopefully what we do is we have a balance so that they're in here eating the plants and eating each other instead of going out there and eating the grapevines. Because if we were monocropping, then we put a huge bullseye in the back of that grapevine because the only thing that's green is that grapevine, so every bug is going to fly and eat that. Here, we have a wide expanse, so there's a lot of things on the menu, not just the grapevines. <laughs> and the entire 85 acres are treated with the organic preparations that all biodynamic farmers use. So we're talking about Chris Benziger and his family have farmed here in the Sonoma district since the 1980s. 
When we first moved out here, we were very much conventional farmers because we didn't know any better. In conventional farming, I kind of call it the spray and pray method. Yeah. For every disease or every bug, you had a spray out there. And for every lack of nutrients in the vineyard, you had a, um, a fertilizer that you put down, chemical one. So we did that. And since this place was left vacant for 50 years, it was in wonderful state. It was a beautiful piece of property. But we slowly killed it with spraying these pesticides. And I remember being a small kid running through here, and it was a verdant garden. And then every year, it would die a little bit until eventually, in the mid-'80s, it was a green desert. The only thing that was green were the canopies of the grapevines, nothing else. And the only sound I heard weren't insects, but the wind. It was pretty much a dead place, and the ground was crunchy. It was hard, if not pulverized. And so we had um, erosion issues. And then, worst of all, the quality of the wine was diminishing. We were really putting scars on this land that we couldn't heal. We realized very quickly we had to do something. And so in, in the early 90s, um, we, uh, my brother had a book on biodynamics that he had toted around uh, his whole life. And he, the book kind of jumped out at him. At the same time, he met this wonderful guy by the name of Alan York, who was uh, kind of the biodynamic guru out there. And the two uh, got together and formed a great friendship. And we started to, in 1994, started to bring in biodynamic practices here. And it took us about six years. But in the year 2000, we were certified, the first winery in the Sonoma Napa area to be certified by Demeter as a biodynamic winery. And this place changed radically, going from this green desert to this beautiful piece of property that you see here today. Mm. It's gorgeous. It's alive on many levels. And, and people like Matthias then have been advising you, yeah? Oh, Matthias and, and Alan have been instrumental in us on how to understand this piece of property and unlock the secrets um, of farming biodynamically. Chris and Matthias went on to tell me that essentially the vine doesn't want to be alone. I asked them if that was true of plants altogether. Is monoculture against nature? I, I personally think it absolutely is. Yeah, and we see that because nature always fills the gaps in terms of where the balance needs. So you'll see disease pressure, funguses, or um, different insects that come in to kind of help break down that monoculture in a sense. And there's evidence there that shows that nature recognizes it as an imbalance. Chris, you've got this wonderful visitor center. People come here and, and look around. And... What's the public's reaction to biodynamics? They, um, they're in, uh, first is wow. I didn't realize all that went on to make a bottle of wine. That's the first thing that they kind of say. And then they go, a lot of them say, well, that's how my grandfather farmed, or that's how my old uncle back in the old land farmed. But there's a lot more to what you're doing than what's called organic uh, agriculture, isn't there? I mean, it brings in this whole element of the planets. I mean, what do people think about that? Well, that therein is, is, there is a little element there where people think, whoa, that's, that's crazy. But it's funny because when you explain to them rhythms and things like that, then they get it. But when you just say cow horn and biodynamics, they think, what the heck's a cow horn for? But biodynamics is more than just cow horns filled with cow manure that are buried in the earth for six months over the winter before spraying the substance that's created onto the land. What underlies Steiner's picture of nature, and indeed the whole phenomenal world, including ourselves, is an invisible realm of beings, some more evolved than we are, some less so, that support and sustain life in its fullest sense. I asked Chris how his fellow Americans related to the idea that what they call God is intimately connected to what surrounds us in our daily lives and not only to a heaven that is somewhere else. That there is, in other words, only one world. In the States, we have no problem with religion, okay? You know, with this God-fearing and, and the Holy Spirit. But those same people that go to church on Sunday <laughs> have the hardest time understanding natural spirits, the, the rhythms of nature that you know, their God supposedly brings here, they don't see that part of it, these natural systems. So it's very hard for people to, um, they're, they understand religion, but they're not spiritual in the sense that they don't follow what's happening naturally right underneath their noses. Instead, they want to have a chemical package tell them that this is better than actually following a natural rhythm, which I don't understand um, because the beauty is right here. This, is, this piece of property is, is, is the best church in the world uh, when you see it in action. You have to believe that there's some higher order. 
when you walk around and see what's happening here. You don't need to walk into a temple or a, a church or a mosque to see that. There's a script in there that is, is amazing. Matthias went on to suggest that our challenge is to reconnect to nature and to the earth in a way that is sacred, but sacred in a new way. And that for him, the essence of Steiner's message to farmers is that the work they do on the land needs to be accompanied by the work they do on themselves. A message that could apply to all of us, whatever we do. This young man is at work 3,000 miles from the Benzica winery in California, but still in the USA. Tucked away in New England is Copaic, a Camp Hill village community for adults with learning difficulties. Gardens, a farm, workshops, a shop and bakery. 230 people live and work here, one of over a hundred such communities worldwide. The founders of Camp Hill, refugees from Nazi-occupied Austria, began their work in Scotland in 1939, inspired by the course of lectures on curative education that Steiner gave in 1924. Camp Hill's approach is, and always has been, that behind the mask, behind the damaged and sometimes thwarted lives in which some people find themselves, lives an individuality as whole as every other person, but, like all of us, on their own particular journey. They contribute to the community to the best of their ability, and it is often their vulnerability and openness that helps heal the turmoil that surrounds many so-called normal people. Vulnerability, but often great skills and patience. In this case, important work in Copaic's seed marketing enterprise. Seeds that are open pollinated and therefore able to produce plants from which further seeds can be produced. In contrast to the hybrid variety marketed by the large seed companies, which produce outwardly impressive plants, but plants incapable of reproducing themselves. Tell us, or maybe without laying it down, you can just Penny Baring teaches on a course for young people training to work at Copaig. Originally, she studied journalism, but her social conscience, so she told me, and her wish to do work unconnected to a system of wages drew her to Camp Hill. I asked her what she thought Steiner's unique contribution had been to this sort of work. I think one of the greatest things he's put into the mix as far as how we understand or, or, or relate to a person with disabilities is the fact that this is not the only life they will have. And that it's possible to do things now which will give them the possibility to have a future incarnation which is whole and healthy. So that's the one thing. But I think the another thing is that through our efforts to understand what people call abnormality, we come much, much, much closer to understanding what humanity itself is. Often on my first day of class, I stand in front of the blackboard and I have a piece of chalk and I ask people to say, what's a human being? And they go through all the lists of this speaking and walking and thinking and standing and, and on and on and on. And then I start, I say, very well. And then I start erasing. OK, are they still a human being? They're still a human being and taking, gradually taking things away. And of course, people are left a bit stunned to realize that even without many, many qualities, a human being is a human being. Yeah. What is a human being? perhaps the most important question that Steiner addressed. But have his insights from the very beginning remained imprisoned almost by some of the people who call themselves anthroposophists?
I asked the baker, Joseph Papas, whether he thought that Camp Hill communities like Copeg have tended to isolate themselves from the world at large, and whether Steiner's legacy altogether has become too exclusive. I guess it, it, it can be, though I don't know that it's specific to his to his legacy as such. I think that that isolation tends to happen with any sort of content that comes into the world. Um, and I certainly would never say it was his intention. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I can say it seems in the, in the biography of this community that there was a time in, in the growth of the community that it seemed really important that it more or less separated off a little bit in order to grow and to become strong. And then maybe that that's also can be reflected in the individual as an inner process as one comes to terms with oneself. But I certainly feel like in this community, but also in this region, there's a lot of feeling that we're now at the point where we need to grow a bit beyond our borders. I suppose the challenge with Steiner is to find ways of bringing what I think is his remarkable contribution, more into mainstream life. Um, he's very largely neglected in academic circles, and I can understand the reasons for that, but I still think he's a very interesting and important thinker, and I'd like to find ways in which he could be brought more into, in, into academic study. I'd also like to see ways in which his practical initiatives can become integrated into the ordinary fabric of society more than they have been. What Rudolf Steiner did try to bring into the world, and into the Western world in particular, was a recognition and an understanding of the law of reincarnation and karma. In this respect, his statement, we are slaves of the past but masters of the future, is, I find, a helpful challenge, whatever the reasons and the circumstances in which we find ourselves. What happened yesterday clearly influences today, but tomorrow is up to us. Ruskin Mill in Gloucestershire is a Steiner-inspired residential college for young people between the ages of 16 and 25 who had, until now, for one reason or another, fallen through the educational net. They have, in the current jargon, learning difficulties. The students work on the land and in craft workshops not necessarily to become farmers or craftsmen, but rather to experience what pupils in Steiner Waldorf schools in particular learn at an earlier age, to exercise their physical skills and coordination and to actually make something as a sound basis for the more abstract and intellectual learning that follows. At Ruskin Mill, they are therefore aiming to recreate some of the earlier developmental stages that many of the students have missed, and in a situation where the role model of the adult is crucial. We don't throw it too close to there because they might, smaller fish might swim down there. That's we right. don't throw it too close to the side because otherwise it gets caught in all the rocks and then it causes sort of disease and bacteria. Ross, if there's any problems, you can just hold the horses, can't you? Yeah. Hop fast! Hop. Above all, they're trying to help young people, whatever their past difficulties, to move on, to take the reins and to become masters of their future. Pollution, stress, illness. Everyone, not just the young, is in need of help. How can we muster inner forces in the healing process? or simply cope with the pressures of modern life. An ally in this challenge is Velida UK, here on the outskirts of Ilkeston in Derbyshire. Founded in 1921 as a result of Steiner's contact with the medical profession, 
The leader is now a worldwide organization providing medicines that stimulate our natural capacity to heal ourselves and to remain healthy. It also creates products which, in the leader's words, restore harmony and enhance well-being. Alongside its modern and efficient production line, many of the substances are potentized by hand, enhancing, so they believe, the efficacy of the medicines. The managing director is Bob Ballard. I think there's a general uh, disillusionment with the uh, one-size-fits-all uh, standardization, normalization. There's so many uh, side effects uh, with um, uh, a lot of the conventional medicines, not all, but there's a, there's, there's a lot of side effects um, because of this one-dimensional view of the human being, you know, as a, as a machine, and if uh, something breaks, you just fix it, yeah? Um, uh, without a, a total awareness of what's the implications of that on the rest of the, uh, the body, yeah? yeah. On, oh, mind, on spirit, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The plants that are used in the majority of Velida's remedies are grown in their own biodynamic garden. <laughs> The space is deliberately not all geared to production, but to the health and diversity of the environment as a whole, a pond, meadow and trees. For Michael Bate and his assistant Claire Hattersley, the plants, all plants, mirror aspects of the human being and, if recognised, are there to restore balance and to heal. The medicines which Rudolf Steiner himself gave us are very fascinating. And, and when you really study the growth and gestures of the plants that he suggested, they can provide this picture often of the healthy working of, say, the heart or the liver or, or whatever. Or, on the other hand, provide a mirror of, of how the, that organ or that system doesn't work. This commitment to ponder deeply on Steiner's sometimes challenging indications about our relationship to nature and to our interconnectedness with nature and to observe what the plant is saying to us is at the heart of the leader's work. Michael also spoke to me about the challenge of being as fluid and flexible as nature herself, and to recognize that everything, including our own lives, is in process. Nothing is fixed. And like each one of us, every plant has its own unique signature. The uniqueness of each human being, their health and well-being, are the prime concern of the Blackthorn Medical Center at Maidstone in Kent, an NHS practice that combines conventional medicine with an anthroposophical approach to health and healing. It also offers therapies that include eurythmy, biographical counseling, rhythmic massage and art. In addition, the Blackthorn Trust has a contract with social services for the rehabilitation of patients with mental health problems through work in Blackthorn's garden, bakery, cafe and craft workshop. The practice also has NHS funding for their work on pain management. David McGavin, like all good doctors, is enthusiastic about helping people who, for various reasons, feel themselves at the end of the road. Sometimes only then can the healing begin. And that's what we have to do. And that's what is such, such fun doing. Because the human being is so resourceful. There is so much talent there. People come in feeling that they are so shallow. They come in feeling that they are nobody because of the way they've been treated, because of the way they've been reduced, because they have nothing now in terms of income. They've lost their car, they're on benefits. They feel they're that big. They've no idea, until they start working, of the depths of their humanity. Others see it. Those who love them see it. But they've lost the sense of that. The Goetheanum in Switzerland 
centre of the Anthroposophical Society and location for the annual International Medical Conference for Anthroposophic Practitioners, at which David McGavin is one of the speakers. And the latest plan, because we have plans every two or three years, is that the money will now go to doctors and we will have all the money. We have chosen patients who are not just difficult, but difficult to treat. And so we all fight with each other because we all know best. But with these patients, they are so difficult, we all needed each other. And if you have a big problem and you don't know what to do, they become very interested in you. And I think our medicine is one of the very few, if not the only medicine, that can take patients into independence because we recognize the presence of the ego. There are nearly 3,000 doctors worldwide who've taken the additional training in anthroposophic medicine. Alongside an increasing number of hospitals, clinics and surgeries offering treatments informed by and developed from Rudolf Steiner's indications. Ursula Flatters qualified as a doctor in her native Germany, but has worked in Sweden for 30 years and was a co-founder of the Vida Clinic in Jana. I asked her what she felt was Steiner's most significant contribution to medicine. It's very much. <laughs> Maybe the most important thing is that you need to integrate every illness into the biography of a human being. It means the illness has a context and that has big moral consequences. You have to treat everybody individually. You have to listen to everybody. You have to find out what is the possibility in this situation for the individual patient. Maybe this is the strongest thing yeah, yeah, that yeah. inspired me most and, and really deeply changed my relationship to the patients and my decision making. So each person has a story in a way, that's what you're saying. Yes, yeah? yes, and the story is sometimes a secret story even for the patient. So when you get ill, something is like a secret. There's something in it that we both have to find out. Michael Evans is a general practitioner from England who also runs regular courses in anthroposophic medicine for doctors in the UK and in India and the Philippines. I think what's unique about Steiner's contribution is that um, on the one hand he fully recognized what conventional medicine was offering as a detailed knowledge of the physical body but made it very clear and almost challenged doctors to think beyond the box and to be aware that the human being has life forces, has a soul, has a spiritual identity, and that all that is part of the, being human, and really all that is involved in the process of becoming ill and potentially can be um, mobilized in, in the healing process. Karina Zella is from Argentina, and works as a doctor in Chile. I was always very interested in spirituality and I had the experience um, both the science and the sp in spirituality are truth and both are truth but I can't find the bridge and there has to be a bridge. Science and spirituality. Yeah, yeah. because I was always very interested in science too. And uh, I was, I was uh, searching, looking for the bridge, and I couldn't find it. And um, I read a book of Rudolf Steiner in Ita Wegmann, and I said, here is the bridge that I'm looking for. Are you optimistic about the future and medicine? 
One of the things that people have said about anthroposophic medicine is that it's the, me the medicine for tomorrow. I suspect it's the medicine for the day after tomorrow. So it needs really a, a long, the long view. So I'm optimistic in the long view. Um, not quite so optimistic in, in, the, in the short term. Do you see an element of tragedy in Steiner's life? The fact that he did die quite early? Holy. Yes, certainly. I think the whole life is, uh, uh, from one point of view, it's a tragedy. I think he was suffering a very lot. Because? Be because he, I think his insights were so far reaching that he didn't meet enough people to understand quick enough. But from another point of view, you can say love is always a tragedy. You come with something really new. It was really a, an impulse of love, I think. So it must fail in a way to begin with. Looks like that because he, he, he was not the big star. He connected to people, he wanted to work with people, he took them as they were. He was positive and all this very big social impulse is, it's great. Maybe it's a little bit more slow for him, but we all are invited to this and that is not a tragedy. I think that's beautiful. It takes some time, but it's beautiful that he chose that. He could have gone to the mountains and wrote a lot of wonderful books, but he chose to work together with people. And it's very great. I, I don't know anything else that is so practical, that really tries to, to create a culture from spiritual insights, not only having them, but doing something. But things are going much slower than, they, than one would wish. Even in me, I'm too slow, I'm too lazy. <laughs> Slowly but surely might be one way to describe the progress of Rudolf Steiner's legacy, not only in medicine, but in all areas of daily life. He died nearly 100 years ago, on March the 30th, 1925. During his lifetime, he frequently spoke about death and in particular about the bond that continues between those of us on earth and those who are no longer physically present. And to the extent that we are open and aware of those we have known and loved, so can they continue to help and inspire us. And we, in our turn, can communicate to them insights and experiences that can only be learned in the here and now. The essence of his message, as I understand it, a message that tries to communicate ancient wisdom in a form appropriate for modern consciousness is that there is only one world, part seemingly hidden, part revealed, and that we human beings are not alone, not just in our daily lives, but in the universe at large. <laughs>